Today, I want to share with you some of the work that we've been doing on Down syndrome and how we uh, took a roundabout way to end up at something that is very unexpected. So one of the things that we are now finding is that in individuals with Down syndrome, there's this aging-like phenotype, which is known as senescence. And this is something very abnormal. Usually when we say senescence, we talk about aging, Alzheimer's disease, neurodegeneration, not development. So I wanna first start by uh, giving you a brief description of the clinical features. I'm sure most of you know about Down syndrome, but Down syndrome is a multi-organ disorder uh, where there's uh, varying degrees of penetrance of the different uh, uh, organs. However, the brain is one of the organs that's most uh, vulnerable to triplication of chromosome 21 or Down syndrome. Uh, nearly all individuals uh, have some level of intellectual disability. Uh, there's development uh, delay of the brain. And there are other uh, features as well, such as craniofacial uh, features that are unique to individuals with Down syndrome, and that's also penetrant. Um, my lab is really interested in the brain and how it's impacted by intellectual disabilities. So just to give you a brief introduction, uh, the adult brain is composed mostly of four different cell types, which is the neurons, is what we mostly talk about when we, or think about when we talk about the brain, uh, which is the functional cells of the brain. Uh, and then you have the supporting cells of the brain, which are astrocytes, which are shown at the bottom right corner here. Uh, these are the supporting cells. They provide nourishment, oxygen. They connect the neurons to the blood vessels. And then we have oligodendrocytes. These are the cells that basically myelinate or put uh, wraps around the neurons so that they don't have misguided communication. So this is how uh, these cells basically have directed communication uh, in a very strategic way. And then we have microglia, which are the immune cells of the brain. They surveil the brain and ensure that uh, everything is, is working properly. And interestingly, all of the, the three main cell types, which is neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, come from this uh, cell type known as neuroprogenitors. These are the developmental cells that give rise to the functional cells of the brain, basically. And in Down syndrome, these cells have been shown to be dis dysfunctional that lead to hypocellularity or reduced volume of specific regions of the brain, which include the cortex and hippocampus, which are the regions that are required for learning and memory, uh, as well as cognitive processing. And these are uh, regions that are very vulnerable at early stages of, of development. And at the cellular level, a lot of studies have looked at postmortem brain tissue samples, as Allison was mentioning this morning, uh, that there's dysfunction in cell proliferation. So during the mid-gestation period, uh, cells that have triplication of chromosome 21 do not divide as fast as, as the euploid counterparts, or the cells that are uh, typically found in neurotypical individuals. Uh, in addition, there's altered differentiation where uh, cells that have neuroprogenitor cells that have triplication of chromosome 21 generate more glia and less neurons. So changing the content concentration also alters the function of the brain in adulthood. And the third thing uh, that we found is that there's uh, deficits in migration. Uh, the brain develops at different increments and different cells have to migrate to different layers of the, of the cortex. And this is the cognitive part of the brain. And when you have triplication of chromosome 21, we don't have a proper migration to, to, to the different regions. While the cellular level and organ level uh, manifestations of Down syndrome have been uh, somewhat well characterized, the molecular mechanisms underlying this dysfunctions are, are still not very clear. So in 1959, Jerome Lejeune figured out that Down syndrome was caused by triplication of chromosome 21. And since then, a lot of studies have been focused on identifying specific genes uh, that could be leading to this disorder. And we've been very unsuccessful. Um, but with the ad advancement in next generation technology, studies have been finding that triplication of chromosome 21 not only disrupts the genes on chromosome 21 that you see here as the higher barcodes, we observe that there's genome-wide disruption in gene expression. So this includes chrom chromosome 1, 2, 3, and all these other chromosomes, and not just chromosome 21 which is interesting because we've been all, always focused on the upregulation of genes on chromosome 21. And as Alison mentioned, my training was here. I was trained as a structural biologist, so when I first started my postdoc, I tried to think of it as a structural problem. 
So my initial hypothesis was if you were to think of the nucleus as an elevator full of people that has that's at capacity, and in Down syndrome, there's this additional chromo uh, chromosome that's trying to come in. So how do you accommodate this additional person? Uh, my hypothesis at the time was every chromosome in that, in that elevator, every person needs to reorganize themselves to accommodate this. And as a consequence of that, moving around, then the gene expression genome-wide is changing. And this has to be somewhat of a structural problem. So this is the idea that we began with. So just to give you a, a brief introduction of how the genome is organized inside the nucleus, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and you all know that it's about six feet of DNA uh, is, is what we have in every single cell. And that six feet of DNA is wrapped around these proteins known as histones, and it's all squished up into this very, very small structure known as the nucleus. So it's basically a hundredth of the width of your nail. Uh, so decades ago, we used to think that the genome was just randomly distributed inside the nucleus. But what we've been finding is that every single cell type has a very specific organization of the chromosomes. And this is known as chromosome territories. So for example, here we show different colors where purple is one and blue is another chromosome. And we can say that this is, as an example, uh, found in fibroblasts or your skin cells. And if we were to look into neurons or let's say heart cells, the organization of each chromosome in space is going to be very different. So, and then if we were to take a cross section and just look at how every chromosome is interacting with each other, is thinking of each chromosome as a person, basically. There are two types of interactions. One is the interaction that I have, the chromosome will have with itself, which is known as cis. Uh, interactions, and then there's uh, chromosomal interactions in between chromosomes, and this is known as trans interaction. So how can we understand the consequence of having three chromosomes on this global 3D genome architecture? So we utilize uh, stem cells, and Allison is, is an expert and has talked extensively about this, but we utilize stem cells uh, derived from different individuals, and we generate the different cell types uh, uh, independently instead of having them harmoniously to create an organoid. And the reason we want to do this is because we want to understand the specific consequences at each level of development at where you have either two or three chromosome 21s. So, so far we've uh, been building a larger cohort of individuals, but for this first study, we utilized uh, two unrelated individuals, a male and a female that, are, that only have two chromosome 21s that are shown on the left side. And then we matched them uh, by uh, sex uh, to have uh, with that, of cells that were derived from individuals with Down syndrome. Additionally, we utilized uh, mosaic individual samples, which is there are 3% uh, of individuals with Down syndrome are mosaic, where they have both trisomy and euploid cells within their body. So we have these cell uh, pairs where the genetic background is identical, allowing us to eliminate in-person uh, variation. So we've generated induced pluripotent stem cells, which are shown here on the left side from both euploid and trisomic individuals. And then we differentiated these induced pluripotent stem cells to neuroprogenitor cells that are shown in the middle. And then we karyotyped uh, these neuroprogenitor cells to ensure that the cells that we're generating are either euploid or trisomic. Uh, that's shown here that the bottom uh, cells have three chromosome 21s and then the top ones have two. Next, we uh, looked at the 3D genome architecture. I'll show a few maps uh, and I'll try to give you a brief introduction, but I'll, I'll try to do a, a summary of what our findings are. So as I said, there's significant differences in, in cell types. So as we go from an induced pluripotent stem cell state to a neuroprogenitor state, there's significant alteration of how chromosomes are interacting with each other and within themselves. And here, what we're showing is that the red indicates that neuroprogenitor cells have gained interactions as compared to stem cells. And then the blue indicates that neuroprogenitor cells have lost interactions uh, in between chromosomes. So each box represents a chromosome 1 through 22, as well as the sex chromosomes uh, in both the horizontal and vertical. However, when we look at the same sort of distribution in 
transitioning from two from uh, stem cells to neuroprogenitor cells with trisomy 21, we, we observe significant reduction in interchromosomal interactions or interactions between chromosomes. So neighboring chromosomes are no longer interacting with each other in neuroprogenitor cells. So if we were to animate this, uh, what we would what we are observing is that in, with the addition of this third chromosome, all the chromosomes are becoming introverted, where they spend more time interacting with themselves than they are with their neighbors. And what we observe is that these changes in the 3D genome architecture are actually directly associated with the, chain, the genome-wide alterations in, in gene expression. So this was very exciting. However, it was interesting because induced pluripotent stem cells or stem cells don't have this feature. It's a very unique neuroprogenitor feature. And so we wanted to see if anybody else in any other circumstance had actually observed uh, phenotypes that look like this. And in 2015 and 2016, uh, several studies came out, or a few studies came out, looking at the 3D genome architecture in aging cells or uh, senescent cells. And what they found was uh, similar features to what we were observing in Down syndrome. So this was very uh, uh, puzzling to us. And here it's just showing you the interaction increased short range versus loss long range. The, the green line or the teal line represents neuroprogenitor cells. And in the studies, the red line represents senescent cells. So it's very similar features that we are observing here. So senescence, as I've mentioned, is associated with aging. And it was first described in 1961 by Leonard Hayflick. And the way the study happened was Leonard Hayflick and, and colleagues were really interested in understanding how many times can a cell divide in a dish. And they identified that it can only divide for about 40 to 60 times before it exits cell cycle, which is one of the key features, becomes anti-apoptotic, the cells don't die, uh, and, and, they, and this feature was then labeled as senescence. And since then, several studies have found that there's significant alterations to the different organelles in the cell, and then that they release the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which is toxic to the tissue microenvironment, leading to more or aggravated uh, uh, aging in the neighboring tissue. So this is not only bad for the cell itself, but it's also bad for the, for the tissue entirely. And one of the interesting things is that a lot of these organelle dysfunctions have also been observed at, or have been classified as hallmarks of Down syndrome. This includes dysfunctions in mitochondria or uh, increased DNA damage, which is part of the nuclear feature. Uh, and one of the main key features is uh, early exit of cell cycle or loss of cell proliferation, which is associated with the developmental brain uh, uh, delays that are observed in individuals with Down syndrome. And since 1961, studies have found that there's numerous ways that you can uh, induce senescence. Uh, this includes, in addition to aging or replicative exhaustion, uh, oncogens or oxidative stress or uh, radiation and chemotherapy can also in introduce uh, senescence. And this is how resistant uh, cancer uh, seems to be developing. So we wanted to understand if it's actually globally, do the, the genome-wide disruption in gene expression that we see, is it similar to Down syndrome? So we capitalized on this data that's publicly available. So we performed RNA sequencing on all the samples that we had. Uh, in addition, we took all the published RNA sequencing uh, from all these different modes of induction of senescence. And interestingly, what we observe is that only neuroprogenitor cells, which are shown here as the last three rows, are very similar to uh, the, the signatures that are observed in senescent cells. So overall, if we look at some of the classical markers, such as P16, P15, P21, uh, we see that neuroprogenitor cells are entering senescence. However, induced pluripotent stem cells are not. So this seems to be a time and age and cell type specific problem that we are observing with, with neuroprogenitor cells. And globally, uh, this feature is very similar to oxidative stress. And as I mentioned, individuals with Down syndrome have higher levels of mitochondrial dysfunction. So there, there is this intimate interplay between the nucleus and the mitochondria that we are now starting to work on. So the next thing we wanted to do is to try to confirm if actually our neuroprogenitor cells are becoming senescent or they're just showing features of senescence. And we observed that. Uh, neuroprogenitor cells that harbor trisomy 21 are in fact becoming senescent. So 
as I mentioned, senescence was first des described in aging. So the field has done exhaustive work to identify uh, anti-senescent or senolytic drugs to treat uh, various aging associated disorders, which includes Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. And there's been clinical trials, actually there's clinical trials ongoing for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and there's published data looking at diabetic kidney disease disorder. And the combination of desatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and quercetin, when uh, individuals are given this combination, this drug can not only remove cells that are in deep senescence, uh, removing these toxic cells, but also can ameliorate some of the uh, molecular features uh, that are disrupted uh, as a consequence of senescence. So we wanted to see if we can uh, utilize these drugs to alleviate some of the features that we are observing. And so we treated our neuroprogenitor cells uh, with the synolytic drug combination of desatinib and quercetin for five days. And then we looked at various cellular and molecular features uh, that we see. So the first thing that we wanted to see was if we could remove these deep senescent cells. And so we looked at a marker for senescence, which is P16. And what we observe is that this increased senescent cell population as a consequence of trisomy 21 can be removed in, uh, from, the, from our culture system after treating for five days with uh, desatinib and quercetin. And I just wanted to remind you some of the features uh, that are key to, to the learning and memory disabilities observed in individuals with Down syndrome is associated with hypocellularity of the brain, which is associated with deficits in proliferation, uh, alter differentiation, and deficits in migration. So we performed RNA sequencing to see if we can alleviate some of these features from the genome-wide disruption. And after five days of treatment, we were able to alleviate 54% of the genome-wide disruption that we observed uh, uh, as a consequence of trisomy 21. And some of these uh, alleviated or ameliorated uh, genome-wide disruption included uh, pathways or genes involved in cell migration and, and cell proliferation. So we performed cellular assays to see if we were able to alleviate some of these features. Uh, and so we stained for KI67, which is a marker of proliferation or cells that are continually going through cell, cell cycle. And what we observe is that uh, the trisomic harboring neuroprogenitor cells have significantly reduced cells that are in cell cycle or proliferating. However, after uh, treating them with the desatinib and uh, quercetin uh, treatment, we see that we're able to not only alleviate it, but even slightly higher trends of proliferation. Next, we uh, devised a protocol to actually assess cellular migration. So we allowed these neuroprogenitor cells to self-aggregate into 3D, and then we embedded them in a scaffolding protein and allowed the cells to migrate out. And what you observe is that the top panel is showing uh, cells. Each green dot that you observe here represents a single cell that has migrated out of this neurosphere. This here core is where the neurosphere began. And as you can see, there's a lot of cells that are migrating out from there in the euploid or the control samples. However, in, in, in the cells or neurospheres that were generated from individuals with Down syndrome, we see significant dysfunctions or uh, uh, loss of cell migratory capacity. And this is really crucial for brain development as a lot of the cells uh, are originating from one uh, region of the brain and they have to end up at, at another region. So this is a very uh, significant feature that needs to be ameliorated. And then after the senolytic drug treatment, we're able to, to alleviate some of these dysfunctions that we observe. So with that, I would like to just give you a brief summary that uh, we went from looking at the 3D genome architecture to identifying that triplication of chromosome 21 or Down syndrome induces senescence. And we can alleviate some of these abnormalities that are introduced by triplication of chromosome 21 by utilizing uh, the senolytic drugs or desatinib quercetin treatment. And we're currently working on trying to identify more uh, robust uh, therapeutic avenues uh, to, to treat some of these dysfunctions that, are, that we observe in neurodevelopment. But in addition to looking at this, one of the hypotheses that we have, which is, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, is that having an extra genetic material might be altering the 3D genome architecture. So in addition to looking at the other aneuploidy disorders, such as Edwards syndrome, which is caused by triplication of chromosome 18, and Patau syndrome, that's caused by triplication of chromosome 13, we're also interested in expanding 
into uh, copy number variation. So uh, we, we're looking at AP syndrome and also other uh, copy number variations uh, that are associated with autism. And a large majority of the individuals that have copy number variation, which is either the duplication or deletion of certain regions, uh, also have intellectual disabilities, as well as some of the key features that are observed in individuals with Down syndrome as well. So there's a great convergence between uh, all of these different genomic uh, imbalance disorders. With that, uh, I would like to thank my group and uh, my previous postdoctoral lab where a lot of the work that I shared with you today uh, was done. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of our different uh, foundations. Uh, I'd like to also thank our collaborators that provide us with the clinical samples, uh, Dr. Brian Scott and Dr. Uh, David Switzer at uh, Mass General Hospital. Uh, in Boston, as well as Virginia Commonwealth University, where we get all of our aneuploidy uh, patient samples. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for having me today, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time. Uh, I, I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic talk. Uh, questions? Maybe I should start. I mean, uh, you mentioned the uh, the CNVs, and um, I'm I'm glad you are working with the 8P uh, as well. Um, so uh, the CNVs, I mean, uh, it's very different from uh, an aneuploid where you have the entire chromosome trying to to find its way on the cells. Um, so I'm assuming that the level of rearrangements that you have in the chromosomes are are are, are way more subtle, right? Um, so that's that's what one would expect. Um, uh, but I think m my question is, is, is overall, I mean, considering all the CNVs, um, how much duplications and deletions in small pieces of chromosomes um, can actually affect the overall transcriptional profile? I'm saying that because, I mean, we, we study Williams syndromes in the past, as 7Q, um, um, uh, deletions and duplications, and when we do like a global gene expression, we don't get much. I mean, we do see alterations in, in genes that are nearby the duplications or uh, the deletions, but overall, it's not like a lot that changes. I, I wonder if you have similar experiences. Yeah, that's a really great question. So for, for the, the, the CMVs that my lab is actually focused on are these really, really large ones. So uh, AP, which is about 20 megabase, as you know, which is the size of chromosome 21. So it's comparable to Down syndrome, basically. Uh, we work with Pitt-Hopkins syndrome, which has about 30 megabase deletion. So we're losing something larger than chromosome 21. Um, and we're also working with dupe 15 q which is a very weird sort of chromosome abnormality, but that is also, you know, larger than 20 megabase in size. So we're working with these larger, you know, massive amounts of gene uh, sort of disorders. Um, and yes, I, I agree that the smaller the size is, the more tolerable it is to the cell. And nature has already done this. So when we look at the trisomies that actually survive, we only observe that the smaller ones in size and gene content are the ones that actually survive to birth. So that's why we see Edwards, Patel, and Down syndrome, and not really chromosome one or chromosome two, uh, you know, triplications are, are not allowed by nature in general. Um, but we do have all the aneuploidies just to get a fundamental understanding of the basic rules, uh, but our lab is really focused on, on the larger scale ones. Uh, but the smaller duplications, you know, it becomes really tricky because the size is small and then there's very specific genes and maybe there's local alteration of the topologically associating domain. This is the structural unit of the genome. And so you might see a very concentrated alteration as, as a consequence of those CMVs. But, you know, this is something we're all exploring and, and we're really excited to work together on this. Thank you for this great talk. It was fascinating. Um, I'm wondering, and, and maybe there is no connection, but uh, individuals with Down syndrome often show signs of early aging um, that have been described as uh, uh, Alzheimer's-like. Are the kinds of things that you're describing in senescence in cells sort of, you know, can, can you follow that to a point where you're really looking at this other feature that happens much later in life, because that would be fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very fascinating question. So right now, we have multiple avenues that we're pursuing. One is, as you mentioned, Alzheimer's disease. And so, you know, APP, which is one of the main genes associated with Alzheimer's disease, is located on chromosome 21. So 
every individual that has Down syndrome will get at least Alzheimer's pathology by age 35. So this is a guarantee. However, the dementia phenotype and when it begins is actually sort of on a spectrum. So we're considering that, you know, how much neurodevelopmental senescence you had might also be indicative of how early of the dementia will kick in. So we're utilizing different mouse models. So we have mouse models with aneuploidies and we're trying to track all of these uh, properties. But we, yeah, so far we, we actually don't know. Thank you. I have another question related to the senescence part. Uh, in, 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 in the question is related um, to the telomerase. Uh, do you think that the lack of telomerase activity can actually lead to such a, uh, alterations in chromosomes? And, and I'm saying that because um, we are growing now um, brain organoids at the International Space Station, and one of the features that we see in space is um, the lack of telomerase activity. And once we bring the cells back to Earth, um, somehow, we don't know the mechanism, but telomerase um, seems to realize that he's not been doing like a good job and, and, and overcompensate. So we have this acceleration of aging when you bring the cells back to Earth. So I wonder if um, that type of uh, uh, acceleration via telomerase will actually lead to any chromosomal um, abnormalities inside the cells. I don't know if anybody explored that link before. Yeah, so that has not really been observed. But what we do know is that there is excessive telomerase activity in, for example, Down syndrome. One of the key features, as mentioned, the aging phenotype has always been quantified by the telomere deterioration that's happening in individuals with Down syndrome. So there have been these longitudinal studies looking at telomere length and telomere integrity, and they find that individuals with Down syndrome have a much faster deterioration of that system. Whether the, that telomerase overactivity is the reason that these individuals have trisomy 21, that's, that, that is actually not known, right? We don't really understand why individuals or how aneuploidy forms, both in the sperm and in the egg, is, is not really very clear. There are multiple ways, multiple genes, multiple pathways. You can induce oxidative stress or manipulate wind signaling and you'd get aneuploidy. So, but in all of these individuals, we actually don't know. Um, but that, that would be a really great thing to explore and we can, we can definitely do this in, in our models. No, that, that's fantastic. And uh, I, I think, I mean, researchers like that will not only help with uh, uh, neurodevelopmental conditions, aging, but also cancer, which is another um, uh, condition that we see lots of uh, aber chromosomal aberration as well. So, Hiroi, thanks so much. Thanks again. Nice presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you.